To all of you, welcome to the Building Capacity and Research and Action Virtual Meet and Greet. This is a first time of a virtual event, and it's a public presentation of the academic and community research collaborations uh, that are based in Flint, Michigan. All of this work is being done under the auspices of the University of Michigan's Institute for Clinical and Health Research. This is also a celebration of a very important um, uh, academic and research uh, a set of partnerships that are meant to uh, understand better uh, health issues as they occur in uh, communities that are challenged with health issues. Um, but it's also a, a celebration of uh, the research uh, capacities that are possible. And this entire endeavor is a way of advancing uh, the way that we're able to do research that has an impact uh, in the community. Um, the Michigan Institute uh, for Clinical and Health Research uh, has always been engaged with uh, uh, community-based work in order to understand better the health issues uh, that exist that need to be um, uh, understood better and uh, explored through research. And we have 13 um, uh, projects that will be presented, uh, shared with the community where this research was developed um, and uh, executed. Um, but also this is a time for us to share with the academic community, uh, just as we would in, in terms of a, a, a published a presentation. This is a way of presenting our research findings. Since we're interested and it's very important in uh, our research to have and to show an impact, uh, which is something that our community partners uh, really demand and, and rightfully so, that there be an impact of this research uh, 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 channeled back into the community. We've invited uh, a number of uh, potential funders to view the work that's been uh, done in Flint uh, and to interact uh, in this meeting uh, uh, so that uh, the new things that have been discovered can be developed further uh, and disseminated and translated in ways that will have an impact uh, in the community. Having said that, let me briefly uh, introduce myself as Don Vereen. I am a, a physician uh, based in the School of Public Health and uh, I'm on the faculty of the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research. I'll be uh, emceeing this event with my colleague, Dr. Susan Wolford, uh, who will uh, uh, take over things at the, at the halfway point. Um, and we have a, a, a number of uh, folks who are uh, excited to introduce themselves uh, to the audience, but the uh, leadership of the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research um, will have a few things to say about not only this event, but the work that we're doing uh, with the Michigan Institute of, uh, for Clinical and Health Research and the Flint uh, community. And let me uh, first uh, introduce uh, Dr. Erica Marsh, who is the faculty lead for the community engagement section of the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research. Uh, Erica. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Don, for that introduction and for um, uh, leading the um, event today as Master of Ceremonies. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, community has never meant more than it has come to mean in 2020. Uh, um, when uh, society is put under extraordinary pressures from disease or revelation or revolution, um, it's community that supports us and keeps us moving forward. Um, 
uh, and the principles of community engagement as well. So I want to start out by um, uh, acknowledging and thanking um, our community partners, new and, and old, who have supported not only Mishar and community engagement, but who have supported me personally and professionally, um, have supported our team personally and professionally, and have supported Athena uh, personally and professionally um, through our journey to make sure that uh, the research, the translational research that's being done at University of Michigan and across the nation uh, includes the community uh, uh, and represents the community and uplifts the community. I also want to thank uh, uh, Athena specifically um, and acknowledge the hard work, uh, the extraordinarily hard work that she has done to uh, support this funding mechanism um, and to support the city of Flint. You could not have any stronger an advocate um, uh, than you do in Athena, Athena McKay. Uh, I got no less than 57 reminders that I needed to be here and on time today. And I will have you know that I was here early um, uh, for this event. Um, and Athena, in all seriousness, thank you for the, uh, your, your role modeling, for your advocacy, um, and your commitment to, uh, to Flint and to Mishar and to community engagement. Um, that you have given and continue to give these funded partnerships that we that will be showcased today. I also want to broadly thank the CE team um, uh, who uh, supports Athena, supports me, we support each other, we support our community partners, we are supported by our community partners and we strive continuously to do work um, uh, that is um, um, meaningful uh, and transformational um, and uplifting for communities and specifically for the health of communities. And I want to um, uh, wrap up by um, uh, thanking our uh, Mishar leadership, um, both our, our newest uh, leadership, Julie Looming, Dr. Julie Looming, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, who has recently become the executive director of Mishar, uh, but also want to thank uh, Dr. George Mashur um, uh, for his leadership as um, former executive director, but continued co-director of Mishar. I would not have been touched by Mishar in the way that I have had it not been for George. Um, uh, I want to thank him for his support of CE, of this program, of me personally and professionally. I want to thank him for his men mentorship. Um, and uh, we look forward to continued uh, partnerships with George uh, uh, in the years to come. Um, with that, I will I will introduce Dr. Mashur um, and allow him to to uh, um, provide his his personal welcome uh, for this event. Erica, thank you very much for that very thoughtful introduction and those very very kind words. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I just wanted to express a few uh, emotions to the group. First is appreciation. Uh, I really have appreciated uh, your partnership uh, during my time uh, as the director of Mishar. Um, I really appreciate your accomplishments and I congratulate you on those accomplishments. And I think it's wonderful uh, that there's a forum uh, to showcase those many accomplishments and, and the fruits uh, of a productive partnership together. Um, I, I wanna express my personal gratitude. Uh, I feel like I have learned so much and I think I've probably uh, gotten a lot more out of our relationship uh, than you have. I was uh, really um, quite ignorant about community engagement um, when I started at Mishar. Uh, I had you know a very uh, traditional scientific background. I did not understand or appreciate the importance um, and so it's, it's really been an incredible growth opportunity to understand, to benefit from your wisdom, um, uh, to work with you uh, over these past years. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and finally, I, you know, I want to express 
uh, my confidence and my excitement uh, in the future. Um, I'm confident in Erica's leadership and the, the whole community engagement team. Um, you know, I, I think this recent grant uh, from the NIH that was put together in a remarkably short order uh, with so many partnerships uh, and, and so much success in the end, it's just a testimony to the vision and leadership uh, that we have and the team that we have in community engagement. So, so thank you all. Um, and I have great confidence in Julie Lumang as our new director. I'm confident in her commitment. I'm confident in her to uh, shepherd these relationships thoughtfully uh, and with respect and, and humility. Um, and finally, I'm confident in all of you. And I'm confident that our partnership together, our continued partnership and continued commitment uh, can be fruitful and productive first and foremost for you. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, that, that is really what's key here. So thank you all for your participation um, today. Thank you all for your work and your partnership. These, as uh, Eric has noted, have been very challenging times. Um, and I think it is uh, indeed the community and our connections uh, that will get us through this and into hopefully um, a, a healthier future through our work together. So thank you all very much. And now it's my great pleasure to uh, turn it over to Dr. Julie Lemang, who is our new Executive Director of Metro. Thank you so much, uh, George and Erica. Um, I'm so happy to be here and I really appreciate everything that all of you are doing. Just by way of brief introduction, I have always um, done my, my own research with the community dating back to 2003. I've lived in Michigan since 1991 and I'm really dedicated to the state and the well-being of the state. Mm -hmm. And since 2003, I've worked with Head Start all over the state of Michigan, often in Jackson and um, in uh, extending out all over the state. And I, I absolutely value the um, bringing the research back to the community. Um, we study childhood obesity and meet back with the community that we work with to talk with them about what we found and gather their input about how they interpret what we observed. And so um, I just wanted to close on this too by saying that with my own team of people that I work with in research, I always tell them that our salaries are paid by the taxpayers of the state of Michigan. And so when we come to work every day, we need to be remembering who we're doing this work for. And if we can't talk to the taxpayers that we pass on the street and feel really confident and good about how hard we're working and how dedicated we are to bringing those results back to the um, citizens of the state, then we need to reconsider the work we're doing or how we're doing it. So. I'm very, very excited about um, the community engagement element, element of MISHAR in particular, and this project as well is a great model for everything we can do going forward. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Erica. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. I am now going to, um, to uh, pass it on to, uh, back to Don uh, Vereen um and let him introduce uh dr kent key and patricia pachowski our next speakers yes uh, one of the things that's important about uh this meeting this is the first time that it's been uh virtual um but there is a very interesting history what we're doing here these uh, presentations, the way we've gone about this work, is pretty unique in the biomedical research realm. And um, the, the way that this got developed um, and how it's actually been able to get started and survive uh, is an important thing for us um, to remember and, and actually celebrate. And so um, Trisha Pachowski and Dr. Kent Key uh, will present um, in, in a few minutes uh, an overall history and mission of this particular research funding mechanism. So Tricia and Kent, take it away. Thank you, Don, and thank you to um, just the Mishar leadership for being so supportive um, for our work. 
through the years. And I did want to point out that we've been funded as a CTSA, that's the Clinical and Translational Science Award, through NIH since 2007. And our Flint partners have been working alongside us since that initial funding. And I, I really want to, you know, just honor that relationship because I think they taught us a lot about community engagement as an approach to research. And for anyone new to that approach to research, it's really where you work bi-directionally with community partners, sort of between community and academic partners in creating the research questions in implementing the research and analyzing the data and then disseminating the results back to the community. So um, I just want to thank them for teaching me everything that I know about this approach to research. And they've really been here alongside us through, um, through all of our iterations of the grant, which initial funding came in 2007, as I mentioned. Our second grant was 2012. And we're currently on our third grant, which was funded in 2016. And Dr. Ken Key will talk a little bit about how our aim came out of, of the work we had been doing in Flint. So I think that's all. I did want to talk to just in our second grant in 2012, you know, we we built a lot of our partnerships in Flint from their partnerships that they had with the School of Public Health. And so we were able to leverage those partnerships to kind of grow and augment. And it's it's our relationship in Flint is stronger than ever. And through our partnerships, we developed a role specific to Flint. We also created a community engagement coordinating council, which was sunsetted in 2015, but our partners were critical in that work with making sure that Mishar um, always listened to the voices of our community partners in everything we did, both programmatically and the research we funded. I'm just gonna ask Dr. T, who was one of those Flint focused staff members um, in our earlier years to talk about our current work in our 2016 funded grant. Great, thank you. And hello to you all. So as Trisha mentioned, Flint has a long um, history working um, with Mishar and with the School of Public Health at U of M. And prior to um, me going to MSU, I worked there in the community engagement program for about four to five years and came on as a clinical research associate um, where we were really looking at how to engage um, the Flint community around clinical and translational research. Um, during that time, the water crisis happened in Flint. And so I was given the opportunity to do focus specifically and solely on the water crisis um, as um, a CRA. Um, and I was able to um, identify um, the needs of the community going to the town halls, kind of going on a listening tour. And some of the issues that came up was, you know, the, the need to coordinate research, who was going to monitor the funding because we didn't want what happened in New Orleans to happen into Flint with Katrina. And then also um, issues around trust. And so during that time, we were in the, at the point of writing the next segment of um, our proposal for the funding that I believe the current cycle that we're in now. And so um, Dr. Um, Vereen and I and others were working on AIMS 1 and 2, and we created um, some mechanisms to really focus solely on the city of Flint and looking at, one, an infrastructure to build research capacity, which is, which is why we're here now with many of the studies and programs that we'll be presenting today, but then also looking at some long-term strategies on how communities that are in crisis can um, engage in research and create um, mechanisms to, to flourish, even in the midst of mistrust and distrust. And Flint was um, poised to be able to do this because as Trisha mentioned, um, Mrs. Deloney and Ella and, and Mrs. Sparks and some of the, um, Ms. Campbell, a lot, many of the elders in our community have been a part of the community-based public health initiative earlier on with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So they had this rich history of um, working with um, the institutions to do this. So we were able to come up with our two approaches and our aims, and we were establishing to build um, the capacity for action, that initiative 
to support new research projects. And then our approach too was to design and implement dissemination and a research readiness protocol. And those were the examples that I was giving to you earlier. So we're still excited that one, Dr. Mashur, he heard us. He didn't just send water to Flint. He actually came to Flint, listened to the community partners in Flint, and then was informed by that and he took action. And so Flint will never forget that. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, and I do want to point out that the AIM2, and that's of our grant, and we call it AIM2, uh, we meet every other week alongside our community partners and a team of faculty, staff, and students. And together we move this uh, work forward, and we're going to hear about half of that work today with the, with the Building Capacity for Research and Action Project. Thank you, uh, Tricia, and, and to Kent. Um, I'd like to underscore a couple of things that they, they, they both uh, said. Uh, Clint, uh, Kent used the word uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, Tricia, uh, uh, I believe, mentioned impact. Uh, in order for research to have any sort of, uh, uh, offer any sort of help to communities that are in crisis, well, we in the research world didn't know, and, we, and we're still learning how to do that. And so the aim uh, that was crafted, aim two that Tricia was, was referring to, was, to, was a challenge to ourselves to figure out how to engage with communities when they're in crisis. What Kent was describing was, was uh, the University of Michigan as an academic institution engaging with Flint when they were in the midst of their second and third crisis and how to how to engage that what pieces of infrastructure have to be put in place um, is not an easy task we're still learning how to do that and this meeting is to celebrate the fruits of that work uh, the 13 uh, projects uh, that will be uh, presented today. We'll get a chance to, to discuss them and, and uh, talk about um, future extension of those projects, uh, their meaning and their impact. So for that, I'd like to introduce um, Athena McKay, who um, is the Flint Connector. It is a very apt uh, title for her. Um, but she really is um, the brains uh, and the brawn that allows all of this uh, to happen and to be uh, uh, coordinated in such a wonderful way. Um, Athena, uh, the show is yours now. Thank you so much, Don, Erica, Julie, George, Trisha. My heart is full right now to see everyone, um, your faces, vibrant, healthy, strong, and continue to do the work of the community. I'm, I'm very full. Thank you so much for everyone joining today. As Erica mentioned, you know what's gonna happen. I have sent over 20 emails, I believe in the last 10 minutes. So um, we have the introduction that Don has, uh, the Mishar leadership has provided. The study teams, we have a set of four, excuse me, a set of six study teams that will present a quick four minute thesis, and then we'll follow up with a breakout room for 15 minutes. There's a caveat. I see you guys are very active in the chat room. Please continue to do that. Give kudos to the study teams that they have worked so diligently um, in our community for our improved health. Also, um, in my screen, Jordan is in the center. She is our timekeeper. We're going to switch over to Tricia now. But if you see the, the green, means you have the green light to go. Yellow, you are at a minute and a half left. Red means you have 30 seconds left. And purple is we are moving on because we got a lot of activity going on. So if you have any questions, we are monitoring the chat. Please um, engage as much as possible. And we look forward to reconvening again verbally in the breakout room after. Mr. Dr. Vereen. So the first uh, presentation um, 
is uh, entitled The Exchange. Um, the uh, West uh, Pulaski uh, Street Block Club and the UMF uh, Social Work uh, Group, uh, Patrick Neal, will be uh, presenting. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Athena, for all your support. Uh, and Tricia for all your kindness uh, as we were learning how to do this uh, on the fly. So we're grateful for that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, our partners, uh, Willie Smith with West Pulaski Street. Uh, I see Professor Todd Womack from the School of Social Work uh, is here with us from U of M. But also I wanna be mindful to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Thwait um, who took over uh, um, and is Associate Dean of the School of Education and Human Services, as well as uh, Dr. Otru Moyo, uh, uh, who was over the uh, social work department, um, is no longer with the university, but she is so kind and so meaningful uh, to people uh, like myself and those who I serve um, because of her willingness to come to us and be a part of us. And so the exchange was, a, was an opportunity for us just to try to figure out how do we get older folks and younger people to talk together? How, how do you get them to talk? And we used an opportunity uh, built around a project to see if that would help move them from space A to space B once relationship had been built and had been made. And we were excited to, to, to find out and to know that, hey, um, relationships do change the way that people view the world and the way that people begin to work together. Um, people can leave their silos for a moment and get to know people. So, so we have a report and you're more than welcome. We have a longer form report that we're more than willing to share with the group um, that tells us that in the absence of truth, in the absence of dialogue, in the absence of relationship, people create a truth or they make one up. But where there is an authenticity, people can put aside their beliefs to seek a better good. So the immediacy of the moment is actually where true learning can and will take place at. And so, so for us, that's where we are. But there's a second part of research um, that I, I, I have to share. And it is a beautiful thing that uh, Mishar was created to do this, but all research ain't seen the same way. And, and Napoleon Hill tells us it is literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. And so this in itself is where we find our conundrum or our struggle. You see the struggle with research that it does a great job of identifying problems. And it does a great job of doing this through systematic investigation. And it does an outstanding job as it dives deep into the study of materials and sources, right? And it does all this in order to establish facts and help us to potentially reach new conclusions. But there's one thing that's left out of the equation and it is the people whom they pulled the information from more often than not never received the benefit them from what was extracted from their li their lived experience from their lives. So I ask that as you go to go um, about to examining and re-examine these long held ideas and beliefs somewhere, um, I, I hope you remember that these people are real people with real problems that share their real experiences from their real heart in hopes that something they say will make their lives better. What part does research do to the immediacy of their issue, right? They give you their best and they receive little to nothing in return. How do we change that diagram so that when, when they give their heart and they share their problems, that something happens, that, that there is a connection to bring about change more than it is worrying about whether or not your paper is published or picked up or you get on the speaking circuit or you write a book. See, my whole issue is, is that how can we get beyond research being so transactional? It, it has to get beyond transaction, y'all. Y'all can't keep pulling from places that are poor and desperate for resources and not help put something back. 
or do you will you keep the modality that you have in place right now that has been in operations for years that university has always tried and they don't put anything back matter of fact they only come when they want to do research they never come when no research is necessary but I'm here to let you know I'm happy for the opportunity to not only to come into community, but to take what we learn back out of community so that we can put what we learn back into community. And that's my hope for, for all of these research projects and more importantly, these researchers who come to cities like Flint, my home and my love. Peace. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, uh, Willie Smith and Todd Womack are uh, 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 Willie Smith from the Block Club and Todd Womack from U of M Flint um, were also partners in that um, exchange. I will just add that this piece of research is very important because it the, the kind of work that Patrick was just describing is work that tends to be done by scientists that are called anthropologists. And anthropologists, for the most part, don't get funding from the National Institutes of Health. And yet, important information about not just the research process, but the research itself um, can only be gotten at uh, through uh, this kind of, of, of inquiry. And so the exchange is an example of the kind of research that NIH finds very difficult to fund, but is very important to us. Next, we have another important issue um, uh, that will be uh, explored uh, through the um, uh, project entitled Engaging Flint Community participation in improving informed consent for research. Uh, and as you can tell from the title, uh, this is a study looking at the challenges of uh, informed consent. Um, this uh, study involved uh, uh, Ray Hutchinson from the University of Michigan, uh, Mrs. E. Hill Deloney from CBOP, and others including Laura Sadig, uh, Sarah Bailey, and uh, Katie Spector Baghdadi. Um, and the presenter for this, uh, I don't have. Who is that? Is, Dr. Is Hutchinson. Ray, mm -hmm. is, do, is, is Dr. Hutchinson? Okay. Dr. Hutchinson, uh, please take it away. You're muted, sir. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Okay. And I have four minutes, right? <laughs> Something like that. Okay. Well, these slides we've shown before, so I'll try to be very quick. Um, so this was a project that sort of arose in our in our hearts because I've often thought that uh, in, in my dealings as a clinician that you know minorities are often very cautious about participation in human subject research and, and certain communities are as well. And so we hope to learn more from Flint about uh, the research informed consent process. And I think what we learned will touch somewhat on what Patrick just uh, touched on. So uh, can we go to the next uh, slide, please? And so these are the, the, the parties we worked with. Uh, Mrs. E. Hill Deloney was a great contributor, our, our community PI. And then Laura Sedig's a colleague of mine in pediatrics at University of Michigan. Sarah, you all know. Uh, Kate Spector Begg, that is a bioethicist who helped us with the, with the development of the survey and, uh, and then helped us with analysis and developing the manuscript. And Alan Luke joined us for a bit. And of course, Dewan Robinson uh, was our, uh, he was the lead for our focus groups and did a great job. And we had a couple of students engaged as well. Next slide, please. So we hope to engage a meaningful and productive community engagement process and to understand the Flint community's perspectives on informed consent, relating specifically to use of personal health data and human tissue and research. Next slide, please. So we conducted three focus groups, 10 community members each with Mrs. Deloney's help in, in organizing. Each focus group lasted for two hours and three surveys were completed during the process to kind of gauge where people stood on the topic. Uh, next. 
please. So we have two slides on lessons learned. These are the most important things, I think, from my presentation today. And it was clear that trust by the community of medical researchers is lacking and needs to be earned and, and enhanced. I mean, that was pretty clear. The cultural sensitivity of academic researchers, like myself, can also be enhanced through community collaboration. And that definitely happened. It happened even before the project began when I was simply presenting the project started. And uh, I think Sarah Bailey or somebody pointed out to me a faux pas that I made in my, in my presentation. Uh, and misconceptions regarding research on the part of both academic researchers and the community partners should be corrected through collaboration. I think there are some misunderstandings on both, both sides. Next slide, please. So uh, it's interesting, community, and this isn't surprising, right? Community members closely align research outcomes with desired healthcare delivery. Uh, it, it's not surprising, but the degree to which that came across to me was really very impactful. And again, it begins to touch on what Patrick was talking about. The community wants something in return for their research participation, whether that be research results, enhanced medical care, or maybe even sometimes a financial remuneration for their participation that came across to us. But I also think that the nuances and complexities of research need to be more fully discussed with communities and community participants. Uh, because I think sometimes maybe the degree to which uh, a particular research project can answer a major question is pretty limited. And I don't know if, the, if, the, if, if everyone understands that, you know, that you're not gonna get to a definitive answer in one project. Uh, or, or be able to change medical service delivery with one research project. Uh, next slide, please. So I think it's a, this pro project was a great learning opportunity for both myself, my other academic partners, and the community partners. And uh, I think uh, we have developed a willingness to be open to understand cultural norms of the academic and community cultures, both, both ways. Next slide, please. And so uh, the potential impact was to bridge this gap between the academic approach to informed consent and research, the trust and information the community desires in order to increase informed participation in medical research. And the next one, please. So we've developed a manuscript of the results of our surveys and focus groups, and we're submitting that for publication. Uh, so we've gotten buy-in from our community partners as well as the academic partners. and. Uh, so we hope to try to identify a journal. We submitted it to one journal that didn't accept it, the Journal of Medical Ethics. So we're working on a, on a next, next submission and we're gonna kind of rework the materials because there's some very interesting material in it. And then hopefully once accepted for publication, we'll plan to seek NIH funding to continue the informed consent work, focusing on community informational needs and addressing the practicalities of returning research, res research benefits. You could say research results, but here I chose to, to use the word benefits, research benefits to the community. And I think there's some, you know, understanding has to be acquired by us as academicians and by our community partners in understanding what, what's the reality of that? What's, what, what practically can we, can we actually, actually deliver from each project? And uh, I think, was that it? I think that's the last my slide. So a quick run through, sorry about that, but, um, I did think it, I, I resonated to what Patrick said, and, and I definitely picked up on those threads in this project. And hopefully, if we do more research, we can try to bridge that gap between, you know, what we can do in research, the community can expect to receive and return from that research. Um, and I think we definitely need to deliver something. The question is what's practically possible. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, Fan, fa fantastic. I will just uh, add that um, this project is a reminder that established things are very important things like informed consent in order to engage in, in research is very, very important, but it's not a done deal. Um, our working with community partners has made it very clear and specifically with um, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, who's a senior um, researcher nationally known questioning the quality uh, of informed consent. And here is a, a research mechanism and an opportunity with the Flint community to explore that, explore that better. And this will undoubtedly uh, be something that will uh, impact uh, the field uh, in the future. 
So our next um, uh, project is entitled Facilitating the Sustainability of the Speak to Your Health Community Survey. Um, and um, the presenters will be uh, Suzanne Kupel of the Public Health uh, 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 Division of the Genesee uh, uh, County Health Department and Dan Kruger from the University of Michigan. Good afternoon, everyone. And many of you on this call have been involved in the Speak to Your Health Community Survey. So it's really nice to see you again and appreciate your support. Also the great support of Misher over the years, not just financial and funding, but also logistical and encouragement for our project and also building connections with other projects. So we, we really greatly appreciate the efforts that Misher has done to facilitate this, as well as everyone who is on this call who has worked on the survey and knows about it because this is a community-based project. This isn't a typical research for the sake of research survey. This is a project that was built by the community for the community and helps advance the health needs of the community. So we have a lot of different aspects to the survey. It's not one research question. We don't have one single focus. We do have priorities that have been set collaboratively, but what we want to be is an information resource for a broad range of health issues for the community. We've facilitated numerous grant applications, not just for people that we're partnering with, but for community-based organizations and other folks that might not even be working directly with us. This data has also helped facilitate the establishment of the Genesee Health Plan, which provided healthcare coverage to tens of thousands of local folks before the Affordable Care Act came into place. We facilitated uh, efforts uh, at interventions where the SPEAK data can be used as an evaluation tool and a needs assessment tool. So this is a project that you know, has really many, many connections in the community and we, our vision is to make it an informational resource because it's not just a standard health survey. Uh, if we can see the next slide, please. Because this is uh, a project that is collaborative in nature and we have many partners around the table, we include both the standard curriculum of a health survey from you know, the CDC's behavioral risk factor surveillance system we have validated items and scales from you know, other, you know, other health surveys that we use so we can compare health trends and patterns in Flint and Genesee County to the state and national levels. But we also incorporate topics that are priorities and interests for the community. So it gives us leverage to investigate issues like what is the impact of incarceration on community health? what shapes community relations with the police that uh, most health surveys cannot provide. So we have a, a, a massive amount of data and our vision is really to be the centralized you know, health survey information source for the community. So we appreciate your help and support with facilitating that because especially after the water crisis, uh, you know, I think there's possibly even too many survey projects going on in the community and people are overburdened with this we would really like to centralize this and we'd appreciate your support and help with that. Uh, the community has prioritized the Flint water crisis and continuing the documentation of the health impact of the community. And if I could have the final slide, just in case you thought the Flint water crisis was over, here are the results from our current data collection. People in the community say, what do you think will have a greater long-term impact on the residents of Flint? The Flint water crisis, or COVID-19. And if you look at these results, there are a lot of people who believe the water crisis will have a greater impact and many don't know. And given just how large and impactful COVID-19 is, I think this is a really strong statement. So thanks for your continued interest and support. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Dan, and I just underscore uh, that this is a research survey uh, that was developed jointly by 
the uh, citizens of Flint and uh, the uh, academy um, in, at the uh, University of, of Michigan, initially through the School of Public Health. Um, so next, uh, we have uh, the project that is entitled Increasing Community Capacity for Food Pro uh, Provision, uh, the R.L. Jones uh, Community Outreach Center and the UMF, uh, Un University of Michigan Flint uh, School of Social Work. Um, and I don't have the name of the presenter here. Mother Jones? Mother Jones, hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Increasing capacity, uh, the community capacity for healthy food provision. Uh, this is probably one of the um, most important aspects, I believe, coming out of Flint at this particular time, we actually realize that there is a food desert in the Flint community. Uh, and it's basically due to low income and low access to healthy foods, which are major challenges in most areas in the entire city, not just the uh, Northeast part of Flint, which creates physical and mental health issues for our residents. This also impacts, uh, the impacts of this is, are very severe for those with limited mobility and financial resources, which affect older adults, uh, families with young children. And right now with the COVID, let me add to our slide, it also now impacts youth period. The over, uh, project overview, it provides basic necessities, including healthy foods to the North, uh, Northern Flint community members who have limited mobility and financial needs. And this uh, has been uh, surveyed since 2016. We currently service and the number has significantly changed. In our um, slide here, you'll see 800 families. That's incorrect it's now 1,100 families. And these are consistent families that we actually uh, surveyed and we deliver to these families every single week. The needs of the, our agency is limited human and financial resources, which impede the need assessment of the community members. When we did our survey, these are some of the things that actually came from the clients that we service. And we have found that a lot of the problems that we're facing right now are really due to the fact that people just don't have access to uh, a grocery store. Some of them's WIC cards and so forth have been cut down. There are a lot of factors that involve some are not able to find the kind of jobs that they're able to work on. I know a lot of people say, well, why don't they get a job? Some people are not actually uh, educated in certain areas. Therefore, certain jobs that they're not able to get. And then some of the young mothers have multiple children with no way and no one to keep them. So there's a lot of things that impact this. The needs of the agency is limited human and financial resources, which impede uh, the need assessment of community members. Assessing the impacts of services on community members is beyond the ability of the COC. And so I really did enjoy um, the speaker, Daniel Kruger, who spoke right before us, which says, speak to your health, because a lot of people uh, in this area, it, we have been, uh, it has been shared with us, they no longer want to address basic needs. They feel that this is, um, there's no program. And if we continue to supply basic needs, when does it end? Is there a, a, an end to this? So a lot of the funders really have backed out and they don't want to fund basic needs. But my, from my perspective, if I'm hungry or my children are hungry, 
then explain to me how you want to put me in a program and I'm going to be interested in that program when I'm not even able to feed my children. So if we're in a kind of a catch-22 uh, situation. Our research includes three research questions. What are your current physical and mental health status of community members who receive the services? What impacts do services have on physical and mental health status among services recipients? What are you, our unmet needs that community members have? And uh, what to do in this project, which was the surveys. After completing the research project, we better understand physical and health status of the community members to improve their services, recognize the impacts of the services on physical and mental health of the community members, and understand satisfaction and unmet needs of our community members. We're finding that these questions were consistent and out of all of the questions that we asked, these really were answered more than any. I don't know that many people understand the mental impact that the water crisis actually had on the people in the city. And some of them are still dealing with uh, very high traumatic issues. We actually surveyed 642 households and 105 surveys were returned. In an average, they were 61 years old, 73% was female, 27% were male, 82% was African American, 15% was Caucasian American, and 3% were other race groups. The health status was what are the current physical and mental health status of community members who received the services. 16% had severe, and let me repeat, severe mental illness. 42% had moderate to high levels of life stress. 37% perceived they had poor mental health status. This is what they perceived. 32% are experiencing depression. 82% have at least one health concern, such as diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, or heart disease. 82.9% answered that the service from the COC, which was the R.L. Jones Community Outreach Center, was satisfied. 98% answered that service from COC was helpful. Statistical analysis showed that respondents with mental health issues had lower satisfaction in services. Respondents with poor mental health tend to be not satisfied with services, while 30% of those with poor mental health answered they were not satisfied with services. 11% of those with good mental health status answered they were not satisfied with services. Those with severe mental illness expressed somewhat lower levels of helpfulness than those without severe mental illnesses. The implication, I'm sorry. Yeah, is it possible to summarize? Because we're heading over to sure. the Sure, the summary, no, it's not a problem. Uh, the future directions are the COC showed higher levels of satisfaction and helpfulness among the community leaders, members. However, as services mainly include nutritional supports and healthcare products, mental health, was not covered by the COC because that's not what we do. We do not cover uh, mental health. However, if a person's basic needs are met, regardless as to what their mental or physical condition is, you will find that there is a higher rate of satisfaction. And many, 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 many thanks. Um, to highlight, there are a number of social determinants of health uh, that have not been well studied. And this is an example of a project uh, that allows us uh, to understand uh, those issues as well as uh, uh, issues related to 
of food provision and availability um, uh, on health. So thank you for that. Dr. Varen, may, yes. I, may, may I quickly say to you, yes. if, you don't, if you don't feed me, how do you expect me to have good mental health? Yep, amen, amen. Appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, so our next uh, uh, project uh, is entitled A Community University Approach to Preventing HIV. Um, the participants are your center, uh, based in Flint, um, and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Social Work. And I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry, Dr. Vering. Yes. There was a, a edit to the oh. presentation. Up next, we have Dr. Key and Mr. Luther Evans. Oh, okay. All right. One sec. So then I'll amend that. The, the uh, uh, title that will be uh, 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 of the project that we're about to hear from is entitled Firming Up Community Academic Research Partnerships. Um, and that involved uh, Anders and Associates and the Michigan State, of Uni uh, Michigan State University. And um, the, the presenters are uh, Luther Evans and Dr. Kent Key. Good afternoon. Um, this is Luther Evans. Uh, and uh, I'd like to first of all thank all of our collaborative uh, partners of our uh, project. And as you'll hear, we had uh, 15. Uh, firming up a community academic research partnerships, CAR, came about to bring community and academic researchers' minds together to delve into ways of reforming and sustaining African and American two-parent families. Very quickly, the focus narrowed to thought about interventions to transitioning black boys to healthy black men, mates, mm. and fathers. Our group of 15 academic minds reviewed relevant stakeholder literature and acted as a think tank to form a conceptual map for a research approach. And I might add that uh, in the abstracts, you will have a list of all of our uh, researchers in our collaborative group. Next slide, please. <clears throat> While African-American two-parent family reformation and sustainment remains under research uh, a, a under research area of study, we felt a need to encourage community researchers and academic researchers to form partnerships in the research niche of interventions transitioning black boys into healthy black men, mates, and fathers. Understanding the current mix of African American family structures, we felt the need to for inclusive uh, Lee, um, patterning the research aims. For instance, studying what works. For example, uh, studying how single black moms achieve success in transitioning their sons to healthy black men, mates, and fathers. As far as the ideal family, the definition of the ideal family structure received a great deal of attention. Uh, beyond containing two parents, we agree further scrutiny was needed. Next slide, please. Our next steps were complicated early in the year by the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, three abstracts for public health conference presentations were scheduled. Looking into the future, we may need to look at virtual means of pursuing next steps. First, regenerating interest in the African-American community around issues of boyhood, manhood, and fatherhood. 
and second, creating all African American male dialogue groups. And third, launching various research partnerships, focusing on various aspects of transitioning black boys into healthy black men, mates, and fathers. And I'll thank you. And if Dr. Keith, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I will say that one of the great outcomes of the engagement of this collaborative and the partners who joined us in this study was the creation of that conceptual model that was on slide two. That was something that was derived um, not only from the literature, but also from discussion and understanding of how to apply the literature to, rea to reality and real life scenarios. So I just want to underscore that that was one of the outcomes so far was creating that model. And then we want to move forward testing that model. Okay. Again, uh, a very uh, wonderful example of the universe of the uh, community identifying an important issue in the community and then working with researchers to be able to uh, get at it. Um, I had been having some uh, technical difficulties and is uh, 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 if, if you would bear with me, uh, are we due for the breakout session now or the session involving um, HIV? No, Don, look at the slide on the screen. We're having, um, we wanna hear from Involved Dad between Sean Hart and Julie Ma. Okay. All right, because I'm, I'm also, Don, do you want me to welcome them? Yes, uh, please, because I'm, uh, it's, <laughs> I'm having, uh, something has gotten, uh, but please go ahead. Thank you, Tricia. Sure, I did see, I, shot, I saw Sean's picture. I don't know if he'll be joined by Dr. Ma from um, University of Michigan Flint. I wanted to introduce them. They're gonna be talking about their project involved dad, strong fatherhood and positive parenting in Flint. Uh, thanks uh, a lot, Tricia. Um, so, um, yeah, look at my slide. Wow. Um, got the dad on the last line. I didn't do that, guys. I didn't do that. So don't judge me. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so we, most people know what we do at Involved Dad, right? We create strong families through fatherhood engagement. Um, and that's something that we've been doing since 2015 of creating um, you know, fathers or men in the community to become self-reliant, self-sufficient, uh, and being able to impact their families, right, through uh, education. So with us working with these men, um, it was important for us to gather some new information. So that's when we connected with uh, Mishar um, and wanted to use some of their resources to, to provide more services to um, our fathers, right? So as a result, what we decided to do is to look at how our fathers was doing parenting, how, not, not parenting, how they were disciplining their children, right? And that was important to me because I did what my parents did to me. Um, so, um, and with a lot of these fathers who were non-custodial, so they wasn't at the crib with their children. Um, so it was just like, okay, how are you engaging your children when you get around them. So that's why this project was pretty cool because Dr. Ma came in and looked at how these fathers were um, disciplining their child, their children when they uh, spent that time with them. As a result, we discovered that some of the fathers that was in the program had a domestic violence history. Um, so which was super, not that wasn't cool, but what was cool is that we got that information. So we were able to get some resources and then as an organization, go get trained uh, to come back and now offer this service to the community, right? So that's what research is all about, is not just to, you know, talk to people, see what's cracking, it's about move, how do we move the needle? And that was important to me that we got that information, that we were able to uh, equip our fathers with some tools to become stronger fathers 
give them some more tools to be able to discipline their children with uh, some other alternatives rather than um, using that good old clap back. You know what I mean? So, uh, so it was cool, man, to be able to, to uh, work with University of Michigan. It wasn't always easy, but we worked through it, right? We worked through it just like anything else. Um, and most important thing is that we got the results. We have something that now this community can now use. So as a result, we've been able to help several dozen men in that area because of uh, the research and, you know, um, Athena helping us along the way when we got stuck and her uh, coaching us through. So it was cool, man. So my experience, you know, was super dope. And most importantly, that we are able to make uh, impact and we're starting a new cohort um, on Tuesday. We have about 18 men in the community that has uh, that have enrolled and we are excited about that. And that's my time. I even left you some. You on yellow. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank, thank you uh, very much. Again, a, uh, an important uh, a topic and approach identified by the community um, that was important and the, the challenge of um, uh, uh, coordinating and working with um, uh, academics to address uh, this, uh, to address this issue. So now um, we come to a, a point in our uh, uh, program uh, where we're going to break out into uh, several sessions. And um, could I have um, Athena McKay um, walk us through what we're going to be doing here? Thank you, Dr. Vareen and all our presenters. We have three breakout rooms. If you could put in the chat room which breakout room you would like to attend, um, our back room staff will assign you to that back up breakout room. So in A, we have moderated by Dr. Sarah Bailey, the exchange. Um, Patrick McNeil was our presenter today. Uh, Dr. Hutchison will be in that room as well, engaging Flint community participation in improved informed research, excuse me, consent for research. So that's breakout A for diverse engagement. Breakout room B is assessing health, community health needs. Mrs. Arlene Sparks will be our community moderator. Those two teams will be Dr. Dan Kroger, who will present the Speak to Your Health, as well as Mother Jones will be in that same room for increased health capacities for healthy food provision. And then our last breakout room in this section is C, which will be focusing on the family. Mrs. Ella Green Moten will be the community facilitator. And in that session, we have Dr. Key as well as Mr. Evans discussing firming up community academic research partnership or CARP. And then um, Mr. Sean Hart, family violence and father improvement in Flint. If you give us just a moment, we will send you over to the breakout room. We also have note takers. The Mishar staff will be there to gather the information that we chat about in the breakout rooms, and we'll reconvene here shortly. We schedule 15 minutes for this session, but as you can see, we're um, a little over time. So as we discuss how much time we'll have in the breakout room to make sure we give enough time for the other presenters this afternoon. My name is Susan Wolford. I'm a general pediatrician at um, um, University of Michigan Ann Arbor, working with Mishaw. And um, thank you so much to Dr. Vereen for um, uh, emceeing the program, and he's handing it over to me for a little bit, and then we'll be going back to him. Now, as you mentioned, you had very a very short time in the first breakout group. Um, and so time is of the essence because we are heading rapidly towards three o'clock. So there are a few things that we need to do. First of all, we need to do this poll. So can you, if you can all see the question on the um, screen, we can launch the poll, um, Amber. And the question asks, do you know how to get funding for your community projects, um, for your research and or community projects? So you can click yes 
if, but I do not need help, or yes, but I do need help, or no, I've never applied and I need help, or no, I don't need funding and I'm not interested in funding right now. So if you can select one of those options, you should be seeing it on your screen now, and uh, we will be able to see the results, I think, fairly soon. So, okay. <laughs> If there is a, um, I think Athena or um, Amber can see how many people have responded. Do we have the majority of people responding? We're at 62%. 62%, that's a fairly decent response rate. And because we are on a rapid course, we may have to close it at that. Um, do you want to share the results now? All right, so most people know how to do it, um, but, I, oh, exactly the same number need help. So um, that is good to know. That's really helpful information for us. And um, if you do need help with funding, Michelle, um, the CE group is here for you. After this uh, session, you'll be going right into our funding panel and so that is an opportunity then to learn more about that. So thank you so much. I'm going to just take two seconds to apologize to those who got cut off at the last moment in the breakout groups. Um, so sorry for that. We will try to give a warning, a countdown before we close the, wor the, workout, um, the breakout groups the next time. So please accept our deepest apologies for that. Um, all right. With that, we're going to go into the next six presentations. And I think somebody in the earlier presentation actually seeded back time. Um, and so if you are able to seed back time in your presentation, that's great. If you're not, that's fine too. Um, give us all the information you came to, to share with us today. So we're going to go into our first one. And the first presentation is going to be um, from the project entitled the Flint Youth Research Partnership, and it's a collaboration between WOW Research and, the Mich and Michigan State University. Um, it's presented by Ms. Kenyatta Dotson, Emery Ellison Brown, Cameron Motley, and Guadalupe Girola. So we're over to them now. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. How, hopefully everybody is doing good. My name is Kenyatta Dotson, and we do have youth on the line. Um, young people, can you raise your hand, give a thumbs up or something like that so everyone can recognize you? Hi. So thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you for having us. We will first of all like to give a special shout out and a thank you to Ms. Shar for this funding and also their flexibility during these trying and very difficult times. Um, we've had a few ups and downs over the course of this year, particularly this year as it relates to COVID-19. And we're just so appreciative to have a funding partner, partner like Ms. Shar, particularly um, Ms. Tricia and also Athena who has just worked so diligently and hand in hand with us in order to keep us on track through COVID-19. And so um, thank you so very much and thank you to these awesome young people and their parents, kudos to them. So our goal was to reach out and engage roughly 10 to 20 youth. 11 came together and came to the table last year and the early part of this year for extensive training conversations and much more. This training was around uh, research, a research training, and we definitely wanted the young people to understand the importance of research, but not from a standpoint of them being uh, utilized as a research, um, research tools, but for them to be at the forefront of the research, doing the research, understanding why it's important to be a part of research and how do they um, how do they improve their community and their family systems as it relates to um, research and using that as a model. While RECAS 
and Flint Public Health Academy with the leadership of Dr. Key has been working in partnership with Flint Youth with the support of the youth parents the past year to train youth as researchers and to interact in professional contacts within their home community, school and beyond. Youth are exploring youth trauma and also as it relates to violence within their home community and as it relates to their personal surroundings. The question they will engage youth partners and youth serving organizations will be, are community agencies effective at improving social outcomes and reducing violence among youth in Flint? Young adults and research partners initially planned to pursue and engage in an IRB. However, due to COVID, the project was halted and delayed for months. Youth spoke loud and clear as we talked to them, asking them, did they want to suspend their project? Did they want to end the project? Um, and they said they did not want to do either of those things, but they wanted to move forward. So we talked to our MISHAR partners and asked, is there a way that we can modify the way our project was designed and we were able to move we are able to move forward with community conversations and these conversations will include youth serving organizations so that the young people can engage in the question that we mentioned before allowing young people to build their internal capacity as youth researchers while strengthening community partners who work directly with youth serving populations at this time, I would like to introduce Amir from the Youth Public Health Academy, led by Dr. Kent Key, so that he can explain the certification and the training that the youth engaged in. And from that point, he will then um, introduce Cameron Motley. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Amir Elson Brown, and I was uh, involved with WOW, and I'm also part of uh, FIA, uh, Flint Public Health uh, Youth Academy. Uh, so blessed to be here. Thank you. Um, so since September 2019, uh, FIA has worked uh, with WOW Youth Ambassadors uh, to build the capacity of WOW um, youth and to understand and engage in research. Uh, so the FIA youth served as peer mentors for WOW youth uh, and met with them after school to provide lessons, discussions, and case studies related to public health and research. Uh, the WOW youth completed uh, the FIA curriculum, uh, which covered Research 101, uh, which is public health, intro to data, qualitative data, quantitative data, physical health, mental health, emotional health, and well being, uh, trauma enforced care, uh, research uh, method methodologies, uh, focus groups, uh, policy and advocacy. And in February of 2020, uh, the WOW youth received two certificates for the training completion uh, from Michigan State University Human Subject uh, Certification Program. Uh, those trainings were uh, overview of human research protection, uh, eth ethics and regulations in human research. Uh, these certifications uh, qualify the participants to participate on the research team in any uh, human subject research study. Uh, this fulfills the federal government guidelines and meets the requirements. Uh, so for the next steps, uh, FIA will work with WOW to finalize their interview guide uh, for the community dialogues, which will happen virtually now due to COVID. Uh, FIA will provide training on coding transcripts for, uh, from the community dialogues and also assist WOW youth with finalizing results for their qualitative data. So thank you. And also I'd like to introduce uh, Cameron uh, Motley. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cameron Motley, and I'm working with WOW Outreach on the study of youth trauma. Can the, uh, can the youth that were working and training with me please raise their hands or tap the emoji just to be acknowledged? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have, been, we have been through the process of becoming certified youth researchers and had the wonderful experience of training and communicating with each other. We look forward to using our newfound knowledge to give back and help the community. I also would like to thank everyone for give us, giving us an opportunity to have our voices heard. Thank you, Cameron. Is Lupe on the line? Yes. Um, okay. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to us. And we appreciate the opportunity to be heard. 
Thank you, Lu Peng. These young people range in age from 12 to 19, and I just want to acknowledge as we close um, that Dr. Kent Key, we could not have done this heavy lifting without the support and partnership of Dr. Kent Key. So we thank him so very much, and, um, and the City of Flint is one of our other uh, great partners through the RECAS program. So thank you everyone for listening to our young people. We always want to include them at the table, in the room, and as it relates to our heavy lifting as we go forward as a city, as a nation, and throughout this great society. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I've been told that I cannot speak in between, but I just have to take a moment to say fabulous. Thank you so much to all the youth and to the leadership of that group. That was awesome. Um, our next group is, uh, the project is Leveraging a Community Academic Partnership to Strengthen HIV Prevention in Flint, Michigan. And it's a cal collaboration between Wellness Services Incorporated and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Public Health. I believe our presenter today is Adam Aldridge. And over to you for the next few minutes. Hello, thanks for having me. My name is Adam. Um, I work with Wellness Services here in Flint, Michigan. Um, we are a nonprofit that's locally based and grown. Um, we had the pleasure of partnering with the Michigan, excuse me, School of Public Health, um, which has been wonderful. So some of the things that I wanted to touch on is what we have been able to do with that partnership. Um, so first thing that we did is we did two separate staff trainings on PrEP. The first one is to gauge um, all of our staff's knowledge, um, their comfortability, and what they what they thought the community would respond to, want, or need um, in regards to PrEP. Um, and just to preface that again, PrEP is a pre-exposure prophylactic medication that, can, that one can take daily to excuse me, um, prevent contracting HIV. Um, so that's, we started with the staff gauging. Um, our second uh, group training that we did is we established a baseline of PrEP um, for all of our staff members. So that way, no matter which community member engaged with any one of us as staff members in whatever that capacity may be, that we would at least have a baseline of PrEP knowledge. And of course, have a pathway to get to somebody, um, namely myself as the PrEP Navigator with Wellness to give uh, further information and of course connective services um, to link people within the community for PrEP. Um, it just so happened that our PrEP Navigation program kind of coincided with the new partnership that we had with uh, University of Michigan. Um, so that with that partnership, that partner helped, that partnership helped kind of create and direct and fast track our PrEP navigation program. Um, one of the things that we found really useful is when we decided to survey the community, um, which we did on two separate occasions, um, just to get that randomized community feedback from people. And, uh, sorry, jumbled my notes here. And, um, so what we did is uh, at our first, at one of our Flint Prides, we had um, the University of Michigan staff members. They did randomized uh, community surveying um, to get community feedback um, on PrEP, their thoughts, their feels, and if they had any baseline knowledge themselves. And then part two of our surveying came from our HIV CTR program, which is where community members engage in HIV testing. Um, those folks were asked to complete a survey, irregardless of what their level of knowledge was on PrEP, um, whether it be something um, advanced knowledge or whether it be minimal knowledge, we wanted all of that feedback to try to get that look at the community. Um, some other things that we did, um, so, some fruits of our labor from the partnership here was uh, created a prep form. So we call it a prep screener. And what that allows is more of a conversational lead in to prep to navigate, you know, what somebody may, here it is here on the screen here, um, to create more of a conversational dialogue 
about prep instead of saying you're doing this so maybe you need prep it's asking people what their sexual preferences may have been or their sexual practices in order to again create dialogue instead of more of a cold um, environment of you've done this so you need this you know um, risk reduction is always a uh, a first line thing that we try to provide here at wellness services. Um, and the second thing that we did was our patient health questionnaire. That is a funder requirement for folks that engage in HIV testing. We were able to get some of that verbiage changed at the state level, um, which hopefully can help create some systemic change in the future for other organizations, as well as to maintain and keep some of that person first inclusive language. You know, and again, instead of telling people what they're doing, it's asking them what they're doing so we can explore that risk reduction and or maybe the necessity for PrEP and how that may fit within their life. Um, Another thing that we have done is, uh, whew, sorry, <laughs> um, is in our next steps, excuse me. Um, so COVID had kind of really put a, a hiatus on our next steps. Um, but what we do plan to do once it's safe to come back together is gather our data, analyze that and have that kind of shape and direct our next steps um, moving forward in our program, as well as keeping our wheels turning for future projects that may help benefit our Flint community um, or communities at large in general. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure, absolutely. And it's definitely been a pleasure working with our University of Michigan personnel as well. Thank you. And um, thank you for putting so much into such a short time. We are going to move on next to um, Optimizing Aging in Flint, Michigan. And this is a collaboration between McFarland Charitable Corporation and U of M Ann Arbor, Division of Neurology. And I believe our presenter today is uh, Leslie Solaris. Leslie, three minutes. Yep. Hi everyone. Unfortunately, uh, Erica Threshold can't join us today. She got, uh, had a staffing issue at McFarland and is staffing today. I'm going to do my best to try to get us some time back. Um, so here is the work that we've done. So some of you may have heard our presentation last year um, where we are working on optimizing aging in Flint. So we conducted five focus groups identifying barriers to successful aging. Um, and one of the barriers that um, that arose was um, successful aging sort of or successful um, quality of life at the end of life actually. So we held um, in this iteration, we held a an aging steering committee to present our results and we identified the most actionable issues was aging in place. Um, we were also committed um, in our Aging 2.0 to building our community partner capacity. And so this, um, some of the funding, which we're really grateful um, to from Michelle, um, was um, spent um, sending our community partner to the American um, Public Health Association national meeting, um, just to sort of get a greater context of sort of what public health looks like sort of nationally which I, I'm happy to talk about later, but I, I, I think that um, in our discussions with Erica, that was a completely uh, beneficial activity. But as an aside, so we held, our, we held a steering committee to um, review our results. Um, we decided to then form a subcommittee. So as all of you who do work, uh, community engaged work, there are um, subgroups sort of within larger groups who are more interested um, in t the topics as they move forward. So some, I think it, as an organic process, so some, some groups add on and some groups sort of um, fall off as the topics change. And so this, um, this subcommittee was composed of the University of Michigan, McFarland Villages, which is an affordable older adult housing committee or housing organization and Hamilton, which is the FQHC. We brainstormed and um, uh, are implementing this idea of we're co-locating a clinic, a Hamilton Clinic on the on McFarland. So co-locating co affordable housing and affordable care. The idea is to sort of bring the safety net to um, to the people that need it. It's always seems to be irony to me that we 
ask people to go to the safety net instead of bringing it to folks. So we're trying to bring it to folks. Um, and our current step, we submitted uh, this grant that we call Unite um, in June. Um, we, so we're waiting on the, um, on the scores for the grant, but we'll evaluate this model of co-locating care um, in an older adult affordable housing uh, campus. That's it. Wow, thank you so much, phenomenal. We, and you can hear more about these in the breakout groups when we get there. The next uh, presentation is going to be on meditation for older adults, a pilot study. And this is a collaboration between Valley Area Agency on Aging and U of M at um, Flint School of Social Work. So thank you again to Dr. Ferraris and over to our presenters, uh, Katrina Royster and Cheryl Rogan. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so wonderful to be here. And I uh, also want to thank Mishar for everything, um, for uh, funding, for extended time for our funding. Um, we really appreciate it. This is um, preliminary results. Um, as many other people have mentioned, um, you know, we were, we had to discontinue the study um, partway through because of um, COVID-19. So what I'm going to do is present on information on the, um, the, um, the meditation uh, study that we've done so far. So I first want to thank our partners, uh, VAAA, Abby Mars, who I'm sorry um, isn't able to be here um, with us today, but we do have Katrina Royster from VAAA, so I really appreciate um, Katrina joining us. Um, and Kurt, our meditation teacher, he had to head out and he's teaching on Zoom right now and our other um, researchers, Dr. Berrigan and Dr. Kim, unfortunately weren't able to be here. So you got me. Um, so we, we started off this project. We, we had met with VAAA a few years ago to talk about um, some of the concerns that they were experiencing with the seniors they were seeing regarding stress, you know, chronic pain, um, anxiety, things that, you know, uh, they were seeing ongoing with many of their, their clients, um, whether it's related to chronic health problems, um, the water crisis, um, financial insecurities, a number of different factors. Um, we talked with them about, you know, whether there was something that we could be exploring together um, and looking at um, a few different non-pharmacological approaches of care. And we decided together we wanted to look at uh, meditation as a possible intervention. Um, so we started off with a few focus groups with a few of the different senior centers in the community. VAAA was instrumental in connecting us to um, a few different senior centers. And we met with uh, both the directors and with participants. Um, they decided this would be something that they would like to participate in. Um, and so we moved forward. Um, at this point, we have had two sessions with two different uh, senior centers. We've worked with Hasselbring and we worked with Burton Senior Center, um, a total of 32 participants, all female. Um, the way we structured it was that we had an orientation center. After the focus groups, we had an orientation and then a four week series followed by usually about a, a three or four week break and then a booster session. Um, all of the meditation approaches that were taught were beginner meditation um, approaches that can be practiced at home. All instruction was non-denominational and used everyday language. Um, for data collection, we had both pre and post tests and, inter and exit interviews. Um, and we can move forward on the slide. Um, one of the things I actually wanted to, to highlight more, I'll, I'll try to make this quick because I know that we've uh, used up a lot of time, um, is talk about some of the exit interview results that we thought were, were really compelling. Um, that uh, one individual said, helped get my mind off of my cancer relapse. Um, I especially like the body scan. I'm anxious talking to my son, this really helped. It helps with health, blood pressure. I meditate before doctor's office to help with anxiety. I like that I can deal with stress better and cope. At nighttime, my thoughts about what I didn't do today. When I do the body scan, my thoughts go away. Um, this is something, you know, what we would do is for each of the, um, the meditation sessions, we would have a little check-in in the beginning, and then we would talk together as a group after. 
And one of the things that I don't think was captured as well with the exit interviews, and hopefully we can talk about this more in focus groups as we move forward, is what it was like having the, the group support. Um, it was an opportunity for people to talk to each other before and after um, each of the meditation classes and gain support from each other as well as from um, myself and the meditation teacher and two of the um, social work uh, research students that we had helping us out. Um, but based on the, um, the pre and post test, we definitely saw that there was, um, uh, that this was helpful and people expressed that this was helpful. And so the next step for us is to uh, move forward with Zoom um, because that's really gonna be the safest place for us to hold these right now. Um, so we are reaching out back to senior centers. Um, we don't need to have a meeting at one center. We can have a few people from different senior centers join us. Um, I guess at the beauty of Zoom as we see right now. Um, and the goal will be to start classes again um, mid-October. So if you know anybody who um, would be interested in joining our study, um, please let me know. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. And we definitely will have um, share contact information and people can connect through, in the, through the chat as well. So thank you. Um, our next presentation is on building capacity for research and action by establishing youth participatory action research, um, a collaboration between the Health Awareness Center and uh, UVM Ann Arbor Health Behavior Health Education School of Public Health. And uh, Dr. Bailey will be presenting. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I am presenting for Mrs. E. Hill Deloney, uh, who was the community PI, and for Dr. Cleo Caldwell, who was the academic PI. Uh, they both are unable to be here, as a, along with their project coordinator, Cassandra Brooks. She is not also not able to be here today. Um, this project during the months of April and May of 2019 in Flint, 20 youth ages 14 to 17 were recruited to participate in a research project to assess the community's household and soil lead contamination and threat through evaluation of the soil and in-house paint and dust, as well as an assessment of the community's blight and restoration efforts using a, a technique called photo voice. Five community members were recruited by the community PI, Mrs. E. Hill Deloney, and trained by Drs. Cleo Caldwell and Simone Charles of the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Uh, the project coordinator, Cassandra Brooks, Dr. Caldwell and Dr. Charles also trained the youth, but they were trained separately. The community of facilitators then conducted field exercises with the youth in which the youth tested homes, parks, public buildings for contamination, and through the photo voice, um, captured the community's blight and the community's efforts at restoration and did a comparative analysis. 19 youth went into the field at least once. 15 youth went twice. 17 youth attended the present and, and presented at the community de debriefing session, doing both poster and oral, oral presentations. These could not, those that could not have attended were at that time working. Uh, here's an antidote for you. One of the students uh, was at a basketball camp out of state, but he thought that this project and the presentation was so important that he came back home from basketball, and you know how important basketball are to some of our youth, to make his presentation. The findings from this presentation will be used to apply for a larger youth-led community assessment to be funded hopefully through the NIH or the National Institute of Health. The lessons learned. Youth are often an untapped community resource, yet when engaged, they bring laughter, excitement, enthusiasm to a community project. 
and many decide to become public servants, researchers, medical personnel later, and they add value to our community. Let's use our youth. Thank you. Thank you. Say amen to that. Um, our final presentation today is um, going to be on the topic, a community university approach to preventing HIV, a collaboration between your center and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor School of Social Work. And our presenter today is Ms. Christina Campbell. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for um, making us, letting us go last. I want to thank um, all of our community partners as everyone else has to uh, also um, include um, Ms. Sher. You can go to the, um, to the next slide. Okay, so um, we partnered with the university uh, or U of M School of Social Work. They had a uh, mobile application called Storytelling for Empowerment um, that was that delivers targeted and tailored uh, HIV prevention messages. It was piloted in a uh, clinical session or set, excuse me, clinical setting um, using at risk youth. And so we approached uh, Dr. Cordova in saying, hey, we had this program back in uh, 2010, 2012 that we did with the Prevention Research Center of Michigan um, as part of their HOPE project in which we had um, middle schoolers, excuse me, high school students as well as college students trained them how to use digital mediums to make HIV prevention messages and said, hey, let's take this opportunity to build on both of our projects and look to do uh, three things. And so the first thing that we said we wanted to do was identify a community-based core of youth to see if we could use some kind of digital technology mobile app to engage their peers. And so what we did was we um, identified 20 youth from water distribution spots throughout Flint that your center had already had partnerships with and were had already implemented some HIV programming um, that we have developed called Your Blessed Health, which is specifically designed to build the capacity of faith leaders and their organizations to mobilize individually and collectively against HIV. And so then we said, okay, let's figure out how we could have peers or what the model would look like to having their peer educators actually deliver the storytelling for empowerment or S4E uh, intervention. And then we wanted to see how would that impact the uptake of HIV testing, whether it was to go to somewhere like the uh, the community health department or wellness or actually even take uh, HIV tests at home. And so we did get to um, develop the, the board um, of youth. And as we were going through the process of using the peer educators to set up the meetings to have the storytelling sessions, we had something called COVID come into play. And so um, that was one of our challenges um, with in terms of recruitment and, and um, COVID. But then we also um, had a challenge in the turn in the respect of IRB in the middle of I won't say in the middle, but January from November ish to COVID, we were we had to resubmit IRB because the federal government started looking at software and mobile applications as physical technology. So we had to actually go back through um, the IRB process to make sure that we adhere to the new um, standards with respect to um, software being looked at as physical technology. And so our next steps are to um, continue on with a no cost um, extension. We have also already submitted a proposal to uh, NIH and um, that is all. Thank you so much. This work is 
absolutely amazing. And what it, you're, everybody who's been involved are just phenom doing phenomenally important work, which I think was spoken about in the beginning, work that really makes a difference in the community. And so that is um, just hats off to everybody who's doing that. Um, and so sorry that there's such a short period of time. Next year, we're going to do a two-day symposium, a two-day meet and greet, so we can just spend as much time as we want to. Um, but for today, we are going to run over just, we are a little bit over time, but I still think it's important that we get to meet in groups so that people can make those con connections. So you can see the groups on the screen now, groups D, E, and F. So H HIV prevention is in group D, the golden years are in group um, e and Youth in Action in Group F. Um, if you have not um, said where you'd like to go, please just as Dr. Claire just did, say which group you want to go into and um, you will be sent to that room. We will give, um, at quarter past, we're going to come back. At 15 minutes after, we'll come back. So it might just be five minutes in that group, just time to make some connections. But at 15 minutes after, we will come back. Um, and then we'll roll right into hearing from our funders um, and hopefully catch up some time there. OK, so we should be moving to groups as we speak, I think. Thank you so much. It looks like everyone is back. Um, we, at this moment, would just like to thank you all for your participation. Um, for staying with us a little bit longer um, than we had originally planned. Um, but we're really grateful for all the work that you've been doing. As I think everybody can tell from this time together, it's very impactful work, greatly needed, and your trailblazers in community-engaged work, which I think everybody has noticed during this pandemic, is so needed. It's so important. It's been a time when we've had an opportunity to maybe we evaluate what's most important to us. Um, and certainly within the research world, uh, community engaged work has been recognized as what is really needed at this moment to help us answer some very difficult questions and make an impact in our community. So with that, I just wanna make a couple of an announcements and then um, move us into our funding panel. Um, the first announcement we'd like to make is that please complete your post-event survey um, that you will receive by email. Your input is very bad, valuable to us and we definitely will use it as we plan for next year. So um, if you could do that for us. And then we'd like to mention a couple of events. So uh, the Building Bridges Breaking Barriers uh, Symposium is scheduled for October 13th. And we really hope that you'll put that on your calendar and plan to join us. We actually do have funding if you need that um, to be able to attend um, and we look forward to seeing you all there. I think this is our third year and each year it just gets bigger and better and we just um, are looking forward to, uh, to everyone being there and sharing their input with us. And another event that we would like you to attend is our um, CTSA Grant Roadshow. So we have two of them planned, one on September 23rd and one on September 28th. It's going to be different in time. We're trying to um, do it at different times so that more people will be able to participate. As you may know, MISHA is funded through this uh, CTSA grant and we're up to, uh, for renewal. We need to resubmit for the next five years and that submission needs to go in. We need to have it completed by December. Um, but as always, want to get input from our community partners. We'd like to share with you what we have and hear from you during these um, roadshow events. So please, if you can choose one of those and attend, we'd be most grateful. Okay, with those two things announced, um, I know some people may need to leave us at this, at this moment, but if you are able to stay, we have with us, as I mentioned earlier, um, four funders who are going to present to us about opportunities from their organization. And we will have time at um, the completion of their presentations for your questions. So for those who have to leave, I want to say thank you again to everybody who made time for today. And for those who can stay, we will start with uh, Jennifer Acree, 
from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, no, we're running short on time and I want to really make sure we get to people's questions. So um, I'm going to try to just give you a bit of an overview about our foundation and then speak to a little bit about a recent community engagement project that I that we were involved in. Um, many of you probably uh, know us for our Flint grant making at the Stuart Mott Foundation, uh, but we also do, um, we have three other program areas at the foundation. Uh, civil society, which focuses on a lot of um, international work, including things like increasing access to justice and strengthening civic space. Um, our education team, um, we actually were really um, involved in after school funding across the country. We fund after school networks in all 50 states. Um, and that's a big part of that national education portfolio as is um, youth entrepreneurship. Um, and then we have an environmental grant making area um, that uh, focuses a lot on um, freshwater challenges, um, as well as some area that I still yet to this day don't quite understand, which is around transforming development finance. So it's the financial mechanisms for getting sustainable energy to communities that are very far, um, very far from us, let's put it that way, including work in the Amazon in Brazil and reaching indigenous populations there. It's really, really interesting stuff. Um, and climate, uh, advancing climate change solutions. Um, so I'm sure most of you are, are interested in um, our, our Flint grant making, but because we do have researchers on this uh, in this forum that may also tap into some of those other areas, just so you know, in case we don't have a lot of time for it on this presentation, um, there's a lot of great information on our website. And there is also um, uh, something that's called a letter of inquiry form. So if you do have an idea that you would like to talk to somebody at the foundation about, you, sub you can submit it that way. Um, I believe at the end of my presentation, yes, you also have my email address, which um, anybody on this forum is welcome to contact me directly as a, a starting conversation. Um, that is what recommend I know a lot of what we've been talking about today has also been based on developing those relationships of trust and doing your work and so um, you know just submitting a letter to an anonymous website might not feel right now we do all in fact you know look at them and respond to them and um, uh, so that's another way but um, in terms of Flint so um, the foundation grants about a uh, hundred million dollars every year across those four areas but our largest area is Flint and that can be anywhere from 40 to 60 million dollars in grants each year um, that those tend to fall within um, four categories well they, they have to fall within one of these four as set by our trustees but um, revitalizing the education continuum so everything from early childhood to um, uh, alternative pathways for adults to complete education and training and things like that. Um, enriching lives through arts and culture, which is a lot of um, grant making related to the Flint Cultural Center campus, as well as other arts programming across the, the community. That's an area that I specifically focus on. Um, restoring community vitality, which is about strengthening um, neighborhoods, as well as some of our downtown development work. Um, and then meeting evolving community needs, which is both where um, we fund uh, a lot of our basic needs grants, nonprofit infrastructure, and then um, a, a wonderful category we like to call special initiatives, um, which is really where we look to leverage um, opportunities and moments within the community for our dollars to make a, a difference, whether it's a matching source for funding to bring something to the community, whether it's one uh, example that comes to mind is studying, um, we, we funded out of that area, studying alternatives to water rate models for a community like Flint and other communities. So we try to respond to the need in the moment. Um, many of you I've seen on this call, um, I know both from my time at the foundation and before that in my capacity building work um, with BEST. And so uh, great to see so many um, uh, familiar faces. 
I think what I'm most excited about, and I know we're running short on time, so I'll just say briefly, is the Focus on Flint initiative that we, um, uh, many of you, I think, on this um, on this call have ac did actually participate. So um, we this started at the top of our organization. Our president, Ridgeway White. I mean, we have a we spend a lot of time talking to our grantees. We spend a lot of time out in the community developing interpersonal relationships with people, but we're not always sitting around a table with residents. A lot of our information comes from, you know, the grantees based on what they hear from residents. So last fall, we met with, uh, you know, over 20 groups of about 15 or so residents. We asked a, a resident in the community to convene those folks. Um, Ms. Edwards happened to be one of those when she was on the call earlier and a few others, Ms. Jones, Mother Jones too. And what we heard resoundingly from those conversations was the need to strengthen neighborhoods, everything from, from blight to, um, to thinking about, uh, you know, home repairs, a number of different issues. And I'll just fast forward to what we recently completed was the opportunity for residents to vote on how we would spend a million dollars towards strengthening neighborhoods. And what I really appreciated again, you know, which was Ridgeway's vision that this process was, was transparent. People got to vote, they got to select up to 10 projects and allocate their million dollars. And then um, we, we published the results and we're funding the first it's seven of them plus partially an eighth that total the million dollars. So um, that's what we said we were gonna do. I mean, that goes back to something we talked about in our breakout room that Patrick McNeil was discussing in terms of you know being honest about, we went out and asked the community what they wanted, what they're concerned about. And then we came back with, okay, here's what we heard and here are some dollars that we're gonna put on the table. Um, there are a lot of different ways we support strengthening neighborhoods. So it's beyond that $1 million as well. It's just a, a that was one, you know, piece of the pie, if you will, but it was an incredible process for, for the foundation, for the team. And we really learned a lot by, by hearing directly from relationships and, or from residents and those relationships uh, continue. So really appreciate everybody on this call who's participated as well. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you so much to the CS Mott Foundation for their commitment to the Flint community, um, which clearly comes through. We're going to um, move to our second presentation, um, which is from Lynn Williams from the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Lynn, the time is yours. I suppose I need to unmute to be heard, huh? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Lynn Williams, Community Engagement Officer for the Community Foundation of Greater Flint. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you briefly and quickly, which is going to be a challenge because generally I talk slow. People who know me know I kind of talk slow, but I'm going to do my best to pick it up here. So the Community Foundation of Greater Flint was established in 1988. We sit downtown um, on First and Saginaw across the street from the Mott Foundation, which the Mott Foundation was really instrumental in our creation and helping us to come about. If you could go to the next slide. The Community Foundation um, is, we have a vision that is to develop a vibrant and equitable Genesee County where everyone can thrive. And this is, the, this is a new vision statement and new mission statement because we just completed a strategic plan process. And um, we were about to move forward and like everybody else has mentioned today, COVID. So, so this is one of my first times getting to share this. So our mission is um, the Community Foundation of Greater Flint Partners and Leads by influencing and connecting generosity to, to county and community needs for good, forever for everyone. And that for good forever for everyone really speaks to the, to the way the Community Foundation is organized. We are a collection or we hold a collection of endowment funds that um, were contributed by donors of all sizes and all types from individuals to corporations to other foundations. And with those endowment funds, because they are endowed, a majority of them, many of the funds are endowed Permanent endowments, meaning that they're invested, 
that the original amount that has been given is not touched. It is reinvested and reinvested and grants are given off of the interest in the dividend. That's typically um, the model of community foundation, although I have to depart and say that due to uh, things like the water crisis and um, greater the, the COVID, there are some other funds that we hold that are not necessarily in dialogue. But anyway, overall, we have over 530 of these funds through which we provide grants into the community over a variety of areas. Um, as of the end of uh, 2019, we have $246 million in combined assets from all of these funds. Just in 2019 alone, we got gifts or, or, or dollars from different donors, from 1,494 donors. More than $9 million in grants we gave out in 2019. And since our inception, we've awarded $140 million, probably a little more now, in grants into the community primarily. Uh, well, we are primarily restricted to Genesee County, and we have some funds that are focused specifically on Flint. Next slide. Um, our grant making is done by um, local uh, community members. Our grant making is local. Our board, our decision makers are local. Our volunteers, we have volunteers on proposal review committees uh, from various organizations. We have committees that are representative um, of youth. We have youth advisory committees where the youth are actually um, they're identifying the priorities of youth in the community, and then they are making recommendations. Well, they're actually making decisions on grants to support youth, other youth programs. Um, the, the nature of our foundation is um, one of our strengths is the fact that because we are governed by community and we are, um, community is so engaged in our work, we um, pride ourselves on having a, a good deal of knowledge about what the community issues are, or at least having an openness and a willingness to hear and continually learn. We're always seeking coordinated impact, and we're desiring to make sure that we're directing the resources um, to the most appropriate things that are heavily informed, more and more and more informed by community. Next slide. So from what has emerged from our most recent um, strategic priority are the following priorities. Quality education, pre-K through college graduation, uh, early childhood, even beyond and outside of the education sphere, access to healthy food, equity, centering race, neighborhood development, and then we also have other funding areas, uh, health. We have a large, one of our largest um, funds is focused on putting dollars in the community in a wide range of areas around health. And it's called the Arthur Tui Health Fund. Um, so we do a lot of health funding there. We have beautification, arts and culture youth. We have uh, neighborhood funding, funding that supports women and girls funding around LGBTQ plus community. We have specific funds focused on specific geographic areas um, that border the city of Flint and those funds were raised by residents in those areas specifically to support those areas. We have the Flint Kids Fund, which was the fund that was established as a result of the water crisis in which donors have come from all over the world to contribute funds. Um, to support primarily projects that are um, uh, supporting, strengthening the um, children and their families that were most impacted by the land crisis uh, during the time. So it's anything from educational, from medical, to family supports, to actually pl uh, playgrounds and things that allow the uh, physical stimulation of children. And most recently, the Greater Flint Urgent Relief Fund that has funded a variety of nonprofits that are out there on the ground providing relief to families as a result of the COVID-19. Um, 
So I'm gonna so the proposal application content. I think I'm gonna skip that because um, it's basic. So most most applications ask the same thing. We want to know about the project and we want to know how you're gonna evaluate the project. We want to know about a budget. But I'll talk a little bit about the eligibility. For to be eligible for funding for the community foundation, for the most part, there are some exceptions. But for the most part, you need to be a, a charitable organization that's either 513, 501c3 charitable nonprofit organization or, or another category of charitable organizations, or else be partnered with one as a fiscal sponsor. We in the applications, we in addition to the proposal itself, we look for a board list, a list of your board of directors. We look for your financial information around your audits and your 990s. Um, if there are partnerships, memorandums of understanding, letters of support, those are optional, but they're always strongly encouraged so that you have them and that we get a sense of how you're working with community versus doing to community. Those always strengthen um, the proposal request. And moving on, I would encourage anyone, however, considering applying to the community foundation around any area of funding to contact a member of our grants team first and foremost we can give you before you even start writing we'd rather um, partner with you to help you structure something that fits than to have you spend a lot of time with something that doesn't fit and then we can't you know help so this is our our grants team you may know some of these folks. Um, and then in terms of grant timelines, we have we typically accept grants three times a year. We haven't determined those dates yet. Um, there are some atypical situations though. So like our Flint Women and Girls Fund, our neighborhood small grants will send out our fees during the year, requests for proposals, and, and they'll have specific guidelines. But at any time, for any other information, feel free to call a community foundation. Um, you can call the main number and, and just say, I want to talk to somebody about grants and you'll get one of the program team members. You can send an email at our general info at cfdf.org. You can look on our website. Uh, each of our staff are there and our contact information in our areas of focus. Or you can uh, email or call me directly at any time. And I'd be glad to help answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was wonderful. And one of my questions was going to be, is there any help with preparing the grant or um, holding it in on what they should write or what should be written? And uh, you clearly outlined that. And I noticed that Jennifer put in the chat that help is also available in that regard um, from the CS Smart Foundation. So that's really important. Our next um, presenter is our own Trisha Pachowski from Misha, who will be sharing with us about pilot grants. Thank you, and I'm gonna to try to do it in two minutes, just so I, we have room for our last funder and we can have a discussion. Um, I don't think that Don was able to share this slide at the beginning, but just to let you know that MISHAR is bigger than just community engagement. Um, we work to educate, fund, connect, and support um, research teams to enable and enhance clinical and translational research. So we do that through various programs. Next slide. And so I'm just here to tell you about research, op research funding opportunities that support community and academic partners to either build their partnership um, or to do a small uh, pilot. Next slide. So three I'll be talking about today um, is Pathways, Up Community University Partnership Seed, and then Building Capacity for Research and Action. And that's the reason why you guys are all here today. So you know about that probably better than the others. So Pathway Awards. Um, and there, you're going to see TBDs on my slide. And that's really, we haven't announced the next um, round of funding just because of COVID and, and, and kind of economic recovery right now and just trying to figure out when we can use funds um, and how best to use them now that the needs of our community and academic partners have changed. 
So we have one, it's up to $50,000, and that's for um, academic researchers working towards their first external grant. And then the second is up to $75,000, and that's for researchers who've already served as a principal investigator on an external grant. And we have three kind of categories that teams can apply for. Um, investigator initiated research, that's really driven by the faculty at the University of Michigan. Collaborative research, which could be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and include community partners. And then community-based participatory research, which is a very specific approach to research, which involves both community and academic partners doing research together in an equitable way. Next. Thanks, Athena. And then we often have our CUPS Award, which has been at Mishar for years, and really um, partnerships between community and academic partners can utilize this, whether they're starting out a partnership or they need to maintain and sustain their partnership. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, Adam, who's here today, he can, you can email him and learn more about that. And then the building capacity for research in action, and that's up to $10,000. We had both $5,000 and $10,000 pots, the $5,000 for partnership development, and the $10,000 to do a small pilot to show um, really health impact. And then Athena, who everyone knows, you can email her to find out when our next funding round will happen. You can always go to our website under Mishar Funding. You can see it in that red circle box to find out kind of what's in the hopper, what's accepting applications, and for more information on anything you've heard today. And just to let you know, we have other resources that can help you write a foundation grant. So we have a grant editing service. It's not restricted to the University of Michigan. It's open to community partners. If you need help writing the grant, or if you wanna get consultations from either a community engagement program or a research development core, they can help you along the way just with the science that you're, um, you're proposing as well as your approach to research. And then we have a new service that we just launched last fall, but it's been really popular. It's called the Community Engagement Studio. It's a Vanderbilt model and that we've kind of tweaked and now we utilize and that's sort of like a focus group if you need information on your grant application or various elements of your research that you're implementing, um, we can get eight to 10 community or patient stakeholders to give you feedback. And we're doing those now on Zoom because of the pandemic. Um, Megan, who was here earlier, um, her email is there. It's kind of hard to read, but Athena knows it. You can always email her if you're interested in learning more about that. And then just really quick, other campus funding opportunities at the University of Michigan, Poverty Solutions has a faculty grant opportunity called Research on Strategies to Prevent and Alleviate, Alleviate Poverty. They have been having new opportunities in the pandemic, so check out their website. It's listed here for more information. And then the Detroit URC is part of our school of public health. They've been in existence for over two decades. They partner with Poverty Solutions as well as offer uh, a yearly small planning grant opportunity. And then two more things I just wanna point out. The Edward Ginsburg Center um, has research, well, engaged teaching and research grants. Their website is there. And then the Graham Sustainability Institute and their website is listed as well. And the four um, institutes that I've shared with you are ones at the University of Michigan that really embrace, like us, community and academic partnerships to impact health. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trisha. That was awesome. And um, again, cramming a lot of information into a very short time. Uh, but that brings us to our um, last but not least presenter for the day, um, Ms. Trifina Clark, who is going to be speaking to us um, from the Ruth Moss Foundation. Hello, everyone, and thank you for just hanging in here for the presentations. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Athena and Mashar, for inviting me to um, be able to share Ruth Mott Foundation's grant making information. And so I want to just first start off with just our North Flint strategy. Many of you may be aware that in 2000, November 2015, we last launched a strategy to focus on North Flint. 
Um, this map shows the area that we're talking about, which is everything north. Um, the south boundary is Robert T. Longway, Fifth, and Flushing. And so everything north of that, so that includes the north and the east side of um, Flint. And our number one goal or our goal is that residents in North Flint neighborhoods create and sustain opportunities to contribute, contribute and thrive. And before we identify what we wanted to move forward um, to how to support that strategy, uh, we held several forums throughout the community and to really hear from residents the priority areas that they wanted us to focus our grant making on. And so uh, the, right here, you'll see the top votes that we, um, out of those 500 residents and stakeholders that we engage, youth was our number one, their number one priority area, followed by safety, economic opportunity, neighborhoods, community health and arts. And so we have also identified the subcategory areas um, that residents identified in those conversations. And internally, the foundation wanted to look at some of the resources that we had that we could also deploy to help support the strategy. Again, that community engagement that we talked about all day long was really key. Uh, we needed to make sure that residents had input on how our dollars should be allocated, but as well as ongoing um, listening and hearing from them how we were doing, what was working well, what's not. We also encourage our grantees or anyone that's writing a proposal to make sure that they hear from the community that the project that they want to, that they're seeking funding for is needed in the community. Um, other things that we are, activities or tools that we use, which you don't have to be a grantee to participate in. We hold convenings. Um, one recently was for juvenile justice system, bringing together stakeholders working in that area to really have community dialogue on gaps that existed, funding that was needed to support certain areas. Um, for the juvenile justice um, system. We do grant making, which most people know us for, and which includes single and multi-year grant awards that can be project, operational, and limited um, capital support. We also include challenge and matching grants with that. Um, we also know that we, we manage Applewood, um, CS Modest State, and we wanted to open that up consistently to the public so we can share resident expertise as well as strengthen our volunteer base and just really be able to engage people on the grounds there. Um, they also looked internally at their staffing capacity um, and at that time we, they identified bringing on a couple new positions and um, some of you may know Tanya Gregory, she's here on the call today, but they um, included a learning officer position. Um, my position for the community engagement officer that I'm in kind of embedded in North Flint at the Neighborhood Engagement Hub as well as our communications director. And so bolstering um, our internal capacity so we can also deploy that in the community to help our grantees and others communicate um, the successes throughout that strategy. And so moving forward, uh, what we fund, um, any grants that focus on North Flint must focus on North Flint as well as um, must address youth safety, economic opportunity, and neighborhoods, specifically the themes that were identified by residents as being important. And so on this slide, it highlights those, and just to mention a few, uh, one was definitely youth um, development programs outside of school hours for public safety, blight elimination, um, economic development, small business supports and development, and for neighborhoods, those neighborhood centers, as well as neighborhood engagement supports. And Lynn talked about um, the neighborhood small grants program. And so really knowing that that program is really essential and important to residents being engaged and involved in helping improve the conditions of their neighborhoods. And so we share a lot more information as far as our guidelines, um, expectations as far as the questions that's included in our, our grant application in our information sessions. And so we normally hold two to three of those right before an application deadline. Um, so, again, what's covered in those meetings are our strategic plan, we explain our priority areas, and we review the eligibility requirements, guidelines, and those deadlines for grants. And so we have some coming up in October, which is Wednesday, October 21st. You can save those dates, as well as Monday, October 26th. We'll have those times posted on our calendars as those dates approach, so you can just visit roofmapfoundation.org um, to see when those, the times are um, for those sessions. 
And so as I mentioned, we, um, and similar to the Community Foundation, we have three grant application cycles per year. They normally always fall within, uh, in the months of April, August, and December. And so our last one for this year is December 4th with a deadline at 5 p.m. for a decision in late March. Um, and so we have changed up our application. The way they're submitted, we now are totally online through a grant portal. Um, and so as everyone has already mentioned, we really encourage people that have a project concept to reach out to a program officer kind of to discuss that so we can see that if it fits or if it doesn't um, and provide feedback as well. And then through that person you're working with or you can submit an inquiry online to ask for um, permission to um, submit an application through our grants portal. We also offer a couple of additional um, resources which we discussed too at those information sessions. We require in our grant proposal your logic, a logic model as well as an evaluation plan. And so we have some resources available online. Um, the address is on the slide, but just to tell people, so some people are not familiar with how to create a logic model. So it'll walk you through that as well as the evaluation plan. Um, we recently launched our community level dashboard a few years ago, and it just tracks all of the indicators that we're looking to impact um, over our strategic plan. Um, and it has um, data from a variety of um, resources sources. And so we encourage people to visit that, whether you're writing a grant to Ruth Mott Foundation, we always like to see that data included in there. But if you're doing a community needs assessment or, or writing a paper, that those resources are available and we put them all to one source so you won't have to go to, to multiple ones. And again, for those that have low capacity on trying to navigate through um, data resources, that is a, a, a really great tool to use. And then for our grantees, we use a um, program level um, level data dashboard. And so that that's the, what they use for their reporting. And they'll be able to also take that information to provide to other funders or, or just to highlight successes from their programs as well. Um, and so again, we're here for questions, um, but we again highly encourage you to reach out to any of the program officers if you have questions and also to in, um, attend one of the information sessions. And so I have listed all of the program officers email addresses on this slide. Mine's is not included, but you can also feel free to reach out to me and it would just be T Clark and that's with an E at RoofMopFoundation.org. And as well as you can find our guidelines for applying for a grant online at roofmont.org. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that really important information. Thank you to Jennifer, Lynn, and Trisha also for providing us with those, uh, with those updates. Um, at this point, I am going to hand over to uh, Dr. Doreen, who will take questions and wrap us up. But I do just want to say again, you guys remind me of, you know, the statement that from little acorns, great oaks grow. That's what all of these projects look like to me. But the funding was, was not a large amount of funding. With a small amount of funding, we've done such great things. And our hope is that by um, doing this session um, that brings out uh, different funding opportunities that you'll be able to take the research programs that have been started and continue them um, to continue to do great things. Um, and so uh, please do stay in contact, stay in asking questions. Um, and before I hand back over to Dr. Doreen, I just have to say one thing in case I don't have a chance to say it later. Thank you, Athena. Thank you, thank you, Athena. This was just phenomenal, the group that you brought together. So, and to the rest of the team also. And so with that, I am going to hand over to Dr. Doreen for questions. Thank you, Dr. Wolford. Um, I know we're very short on time, but um, are there any questions or comments that folks would like to make about uh, the, these um, funding opportunities uh, that have just been presented? Just one comment, Dr. Vereen. Yes, thank you. I think what we've seen uh, with um, adding our funding partners to the discussion is our modeling 
but we've been talking about, we've been talking about this a lot, including our funders in our discussions and having them as part of our planning, but to have all of them show here and talk about their process, I think was really a great idea. And especially with a lot of the community folks still on the line. I think it was awesome, so thank you. Well, thank, thank you. We'll remember that in the, in the future. And anyone else? Any thoughts? This is Jennifer. I just want to echo that it was, I'm really glad that Athena did reach out and ask us to listen in on these presentations because it gives us a whole nother lens to what's happening in the community and the different ways that work is happening on the ground. So yes, I think it was a brilliant idea, Miss Athena. This is Arlene, uh, a gentleman asked on the uh, panel I was moderating, had these people met before because the two I was moderating had similar ideas and maybe could have complemented each other. Um, so that's a question to us. I, some have, but part of the reason for this um, meet and greet is so that there can be an exchange of ideas. Um, and uh, Miss Athena McKay gets credit for that idea as well, going back uh, uh, three years. Um, and I'll add to that, that the cadre of people who are doing research together, it's important for them uh, to interact and collaborate uh, with each other to share expenses, uh, experiences. Uh, we in the research world do that a lot, but we do it amongst ourselves. We don't necessarily interact with the communities where we're doing research or the communities where we're hoping our research will have the impact that it, it needs to have. Um, but what you're uh, uh, also pointing out, uh, Mrs. Sparks, is um, the synergy that's, potenti that's potentially possible when we bring people together with um, uh, uh, ideas on how to use research to help their communities. Dr. Vereen, I think also that it, uh, this process helps folk to understand uh, not, not all um, partnerships are great, you know, not, not everything goes well, but to listen to some of the other partnerships and be able to glean from their experiences mm -hmm. and correct or learn from and grow from some of the things that happen in other partnerships and to know that they can talk about that I think is is great so um, thanks for that as well and thank you for that point uh, Ms. Green Moten um, uh, the uh, partnership and the quality of the partnership we uh, at Mishar uh, understand and respect uh, the time and the energy that it takes uh, to develop a, a, a viable uh, uh, academic community of, of partnered research uh, team. And we are actually studying and working very hard to understand how to assess the quality of those partnerships. Uh, it's an important research uh, question for us and I'm glad you mentioned it because that support for uh, that effort on, on our part that we can get back to you on. Uh, this is Patrick McNeil. Just wanted to just thank everyone. Uh, thank the funders. Um, the good part about it is being a community organization and knowing the funders, even before we get to this room is always helpful. So thank you, Lynn. Great job. Thank you, Trafina. Great job. Thank you, Jennifer. Great job. And thank you, Tricia, for sharing how we might even be able to begin to look into developing those partnerships uh, with the university that we may not have even looked at before because we were just simply unaware. So thank you for the opportunity to, to be a part of this. And I'm looking forward to working with some of you groups in the future. And I just wanted to add one thing. I know I was uh, rushing through my presentation, but like I mentioned, in, um, for Roofline Foundation, we do look at program effectiveness. And so a lot of times with the research data that you have 
or even with best practices that have been identified for certain projects that can make an impact on the priority areas we're focusing in on, it's always good to talk about that um, in your project, what you have learned already and how do you how have you determined that your program will be effective in the work that you do in Flint? And so even like, you know, case by case, we look at what we can fund towards research. But I, I think it's always a good key and note to mention that the work that you have already done now and just laying out the pathway forward to how you want to begin to implement some of those projects and programs moving forward will always be of interest to funders. And I'd just like to say thank you um, for spending your Friday afternoon with us. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the community. Thank you for staying safe um, and protecting our constituents in the many ways that you do. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to Jennifer, to Lynn and Trafina, and to the many avenues that the University of Michigan has to fund your projects. Um, we have tons of dollars for COVID-related projects and we need your wisdom we need your expertise to so that we can continue to impact the community for a better world for all of us thank you so much dr reen dr marsh did you have closing remarks just uh, echoing what we started off with we will end with thank you trevina um, for your extraordinary job uh, your extraordinary commitment um, and thank you to everybody on this call, particularly um, uh, all of our partners in Flint, all of my mothers in Flint that have taken me under their wing, um, particularly when, you know, as somebody who was new to Michigan, but not new to community engagement. Thank you for getting me off on a, on a, um, uh, on a strong start. Um, and thank you for your wisdom and your expertise um i we don't say that out loud enough the academia doesn't say that out loud enough and doesn't recognize that um there is wisdom there is expertise in community engagement and in, and in our community partners um the reason i had to step away from this call for a little while is because uh of i had to join a nih call for the seal grant as many of you on this call know, mm -hmm. um, uh, members of CE sent a very hurried email out to you um, just three weeks ago, actually, saying, we just heard about this grant. It's due in seven days. We we, this is not how we roll, but if we want to go for it, we got seven days to go for it. And because of your trust, exactly, kudos to you. Because mm -hmm. of your trust, um, because of the CE team, because of the wisdom and expertise of our, our partners, and your phenomenally long track record of doing this before there was a CE, before we had a name for it, when it was just called doing good, mm -hmm. being neighborly, doing the right thing. Um, because of all of that, we found out um, that we've got, you know, Michigan is getting one of those grants um, that's going to help us address uh, COVID-19 misinformation um, uh, uh, issues around um, knowledge and, and information around trial vaccine trials, as well as uh, knowledge and information around vaccines um, in general. Now, those are complicated issues. We're not pretending that they're not, but we look forward I and mean, it was because of you um, that we we got we were awarded that grant and we know that and we carry that with us and we look forward to your continued partnership I also I know we got to go but I also want to say as we look forward to the next CTSA grant um, uh, I know that um, in addition to continuing to focus on Clint Flint because you have been so exceptional in your track record because um, you, you, know, you have this long standing expertise, part of the goal of the next grant is to take, take what you have in Flint and see if we can expand it across the state. And that's another thing that we look forward to partnering with you 
on. This is based on feedback we've gotten at our pre-retreat when I was brand, brand new, um, and that at the last couple of state retreats. Um, and, you know, everybody wants what Flint has. <laughs> you know, people have said, I want what, I want to be able to do what they do. Um, I don't think that they fully recognize the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years that some of you have been doing the work, but they want what you have. And we look forward to, to doing our best to take what, um, to, to, to take your expertise, to take your perspective, to take your wisdom and sharing it with communities across the state that are much newer in this space um, than, than, than certainly you are. So I know um, uh, expansion to statewide, people hear that differently. Um, that's not us pulling away from Flint. It is actually honoring Flint and honoring what you've done and honoring um, your accomplishments and your expertise and trying to help communities who don't have anything that looks remotely like this, help them get off to a good start. Um, so we look forward to your continued partnership. Uh, we look forward to, um, like I said, your wisdom and your expertise and your guidance. Um, and uh, we thank you, we thank Athena. I wanna thank the CE team. Um, with a uh, shout out to Trisha for, for being right hand, left hand and everything else. Um, and all of the special guests who, who came and shared their funding expertise as well as of course, uh, Dr. Wolford and Dr. Vereen for serving as masters of ceremony um, today and, um, and everybody who made the program possible. So thanks everybody, happy Friday, happy weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, amen. Everybody. And take care, everyone.